Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to Your Finance TV. As always on Fridays, we have Jay Pulaski here to give us his thoughts from the week. How are you, Jay? Good, Scott. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm going on holidays next week. So no, no show, unfortunately, for the viewers next week, but I can't wait to, to jump on that plane and get down to Florida. Yeah. All right. What was that you, you told me that you were going to be bringing? I'm definitely bringing some clothes that I'm, I'm joking around that they're inappropriate, but that's a, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my kids aren't happy about it. But let's talk about the title to your musings this week, Time Travel. Now, you being a movie buff that you are, like, sure, let's think about some of your best time travel movies, like Back to the Future. You can throw Terminator in there. You could even show in throwing Palm Springs, which I think you've probably never seen, which is on Hulu. Talk to us about time travel. Yeah, I'd go with Terminator out of those three, um, <laughs> just, 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 you know, for myself. Uh, well, it really struck me, uh, Scott, that, uh, you know, we did the monthly last week, The Shape of Things to Come, where we really laid out our positive uh, view towards the 2023-2027 time period and tied it into the 1995 to 1999 U.S. period as our analog. And it's somehow, you know, when you, when you do these big lifts like the monthly, 6,500 words, 33 charts and tables, sometimes the insights come after you've done them rather than before. And so this week, as I was just noodling on kind of what to, what to write about, it struck me that the shape of things to come, last week's title for that monthly, really fits as a body of work in a sequence of work that we've done going back now several years to the summer of 2022 when we introduced our middle path thesis. And there we were arguing that there's a pathway between high inflation and deep recession, which is where most people work. They were either really worried about inflation or really convinced we're going into a deep recession. At TPW Advisory, we made the case that there's a middle path. And so that was summer of 2022. And then um, in uh, the fall of 2023, we wrote our outlook for this year titled Surprise, Surprise, talking about how lower inflation was coming, better productivity, return to stability, and that we are early cycle, not late in the global economy. And so today we talk, or last week and going into today and going forward, we're really focused on the future in this 2023 to 2027 period. And we believe that given that markets are forward looking, discounting mechanisms, you almost have to have a foot in the future if you are going to be able to outperform uh, markets that are forward looking. And so we want to be relentlessly focused forward. And we do that in part by taking these steps of work, these bodies of work, and kind of link linking them and sequencing them together to kind of maintain a coherent focus as we move forward. So that's really the idea of time travel in terms of our work. We're traveling through time, kind of matching our footsteps, stepping into the future with work that is built off of past work, essentially. Okay. Well, we know that the big banks don't have any time travel machines because they had forecasts for six rate cuts this year. I think Bank of America came out the other day now saying one. <laughs> um, we've obviously had a lot of Fed, uh, Fed action this week. Obviously, we had the great decision. We've had a lot of speakers going out there, Powell talking, so much noise from them even on the inflation side, like, should we be worried about any of this? Or are you listening to any of it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Because remember, two months ago, we wrote a piece called Handoff, where we argued that effectively markets are moving away from rate cut dependency towards a more stable future built on economic growth and earnings acceleration. And so we, were, we talked about how we would happily trade rate cuts for earnings growth. And that's effectively what we've done uh, in the markets over the last month or two. And we point out in this musings that 10-year treasury rates are up about 50 basis points year to date from where they ended last year. And yet the S&P is up 9% or so, the ACWI is up seven, and commodities are up 13%, whereas bonds represented by the ag 
are down about are down about four percent. So you can see with that move of rates up, yet stocks also up, and then even more of a tell commodities outperforming stocks. It's telling you that the market is focused not on rate cuts, but on economic acceleration and earnings growth. And so we'll see uh, now that we are in earnings season, right, with the banks kicking us off today, consensus is for 4% earnings growth, and we'll see how we do. I think 4% should be pretty easy, given that Q1 GDP was probably get, is probably going to come in somewhere around 2.5%. So we are optimistic on the earnings front, but more importantly, we really don't pay much attention to the Fed. Whether they cut three or two or one, um, as long as they're not talking about raising, and some people like Larry Summers have started to talk about rate hikes, which I think is completely unlikely, um, we think that the market is going to be fine, underpinned by economic growth, and more importantly, earnings growth. Okay, well, let's stick with this whole time traveling thing. Let's go back to like when I first started doing videos with you and you, you talked about your tripolar world. Now, that was something new to me. Uh, I really do agree with the thesis you have on it. I think it's great. And But obviously, we've been doing these videos a couple of years now. What's evolved in the whole tripolar world? Like what's changed in your thesis or is it still the same? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great um, example of, again, this idea of time travel, right? We actually started writing about the tripolar world back in around 2010, 2011, as a response to the great financial crisis. And we argued that the world's operating system is basically moving to regional integration and regional deepening in the three main regions of Europe, Asia, and the Americas, thus the tripolar world. And what we're seeing now is that it's actually manifesting in real time. And it's really kind of cool. And we, again, in the musings today, talk about just going through some of our reading this morning, our morning routine of looking at different uh, sources of information. There were at least three or four stories uh, about uh, regional integration uh, across different regions with different companies. One was uh, Volvo announcing multi-billion dollar investment uh, in their Mexico plant to start producing trucks for the North American market. So that's an example of a European company deepening its activities in the Americas to service the clients uh, in, in the Americas. Another was Volkswagen, likewise spending billions uh, to deepen and build out their production platform in China. So a European company in Asia. And then the third that really struck us was Fujifilm, which is a Japanese company investing billions in the US and in Europe to compete in the biopharmaceutical space, which is growing rapidly. So that, that article talked about several billion dollars of investment by Fuji in their North Carolina plant. And then the this all followed uh, the news on Monday when President Biden announced that Samsung and TSMC are uh, going to be recipients of several billion dollars from the CHIPS Act to expand their semi-production uh, platforms here in the United States. So all this is, is driving this idea of a public-private partnership to develop semis, AI, climate mitigation, electric vehicles, batteries, et cetera. It really is setting off what we see as a global CapEx boom and we believe that's one of the key underpinnings to our thesis that we're in a period of better than expected global economic growth emanating from 2023 through 2027. And so it really is the manifestation of this tripolar world thesis, which again, we argue that a world that is built on a kind of a three-legged stool, you know, regional deepening in Asia, regional deepening in the Americas, regional deepening in Europe, is a much more stable operating system than a global economy dependent on either the U.S. consumer or China stimulus, which has really been the two, those have been the two drivers over the last 30 or 40 years. And so we're really keen, and, and we think it's kind of cool to actually see, you know, whenever you, almost in, daily at this point, you can you can see examples of the tripolar tripolar world 
really manifesting itself in real time. Let's move on to a topic which I always seem to be a pessimist on is the IMF. <laughs> now, I always feel like they're wrong. I think it's the easiest way I can summarise that. But everyone always listens to them when they come out with comments. What do you think about the comments from the IMF this week? Yeah, no, you're absolutely uh, spot on. We would join you with that view, by the way. And this is the week where you hear a lot from the IMF and the World Bank because it's their annual meetings uh, coming up uh, this coming week in Washington, which always attracts tons of policymakers and macro thinkers. And typically the consensus is a strong one. And it reminds me of last year when one of my buddies who's gone to this uh, this weekly event uh, for 20 years came back and told me it was the most negative he had ever seen the consensus. Everybody was negative. Because if you recall, a year ago, we were deep in the recession camp, right? Everyone was bearish. TBW advisory, we were not, but the vast majority of people were very bearish, very recession focused. And so I went back and actually looked and guess what? Over the last year, ACWI, global equities are up 18%. And bonds represented by the ag are down four percent. So that bearish view clearly uh, did not work out very well last year. And so fast forward to today, and we just had the IMF head, uh, the managing director, uh, speak yesterday. And their the main takeaway uh, from her speech was basically she's afraid of a tepid twenties period. So the decade of the twenties risks being tepid because of all the concerns around debt, around inflation, around war, around uh, climate, etc. So that's the setup, the tepid 20s. Obviously, it uh, is directly against what we just laid out in the shape of thing to come in our monthly last week of this blue sky macro period from 2023 to 2027 of better than expected global growth. And I would note, kind of in defense of our view, that uh, analysts are now starting to come out with their 2026 earnings forecasts uh, for U.S. companies. And the consensus is $302 for 2026 earnings for the S&P. That would represent three years in a row of 10% or better double-digit earnings gains. So 24, 25, 26. And that, the last time that that happened uh, was in the mid-90s, that period that, again, we're using as our analog, 1995 to 1999, was one of the last periods where we saw three years in a row of double-digit earnings gains. The markets today are calling for three years of double-digit earnings gains. We would agree with that thesis and find that as being very supportive of risk assets and very directly against the view expressed by the head of the IMF, worried about a tepid 20s. So we'll take the other side of that, much as we do. I write in the musings that the IMF meetings, the consensus there, it's very similar to Davos, right? Davos, man, whatever Davos decides is almost always bet against that. Same with the Economist covers. When the Economist comes out with a big cover on certain issues, take the other side. Almost always works. Now, Jay, we did a great video last week, your monthly piece. Uh, a lot of great, great feedback on that. Uh, viewers, go check that one out. It's obviously on our YouTube page. Now, obviously, after you've done that, you usually go through your model updates. Anything of note you should be pointing out to the viewers? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, we do a, a deep, uh, pretty deep technical dive. We look at all the technical charts of all our holdings, the benchmarks, et cetera. And there were definitely a couple of takeaways. One was that, uh, the equity market has really worked off the overbought conditions that existed a couple of weeks ago. We only had two or three overbought positions out of roughly 30 in our global multi-asset model. And they were all no surprise in the commodity space. And so that was the second takeaway that the markets have done a really nice job of, of kind of segueing away from the Magnificent Seven. Remember the craze a month or two ago was Magnificent Seven, Magnificent Four, whatever. The reality is that the market's been led over the last period by the commodity space. And of the five leading uh, model positions we had over this latest period, 
four of them were commodities, gold, copper, energy, and uranium. And those were, uh, those were the big winners. And so uh, that really um, uh, was the second takeaway. And then the third, um, almost all of our positions are above their 50, 100, and 200 day moving averages. And so that's really, that has, we haven't seen that in quite a long time. Uh, again, suggesting that there's been a, it's been a very broad based, very healthy uh, move higher. And so we really concluded that um, the areas of opportunity for us continue to be in commodities and in emerging markets. Uh, for our long, fee, our long view or thesis of better than expected global growth for several years, those are the opportunities where there's plenty of upside for commodities to get back to their all-time high. Plenty of upside for emerging markets to get back to their all-time high. Whereas ACWI, the S&P, the Qs are already at all-time new highs. And so uh, we remain focused on the idea of kind of like an AI commodity barbell. This is something that's really interesting to us. Uh, thinking about the energy needs for AI, right? And then the commodities to provide that energy. So we really like that idea. And we note uh, the other idea that we're really focused on continues to be um, KWEB and this idea of a two-tech st two stack with China and the U.S. basically walling off their tech stacks from each other. Uh, we think KWEB is really an opportunity. And we note that it, this week it broke through its 200-day resistance level, uh, which we see is a really good sign. Um, and would note that it has considerable room to move higher. So we continue to like uh, in this uh, little bit of a pullback, uh, the emerging market space, particularly China, uh, as well as the commodity space um, as areas of opportunity. Not so worried about what the Fed is going to do or not do really looking at the transition away from rate cut dependency to earnings growth and economic recovery and continue to be focused on a view that argues the next several years should be quite constructive for risk assets. All right. Well, listen, also for viewers, don't forget, uh, Tom and Sam is actually reporting Thursday pre-market next week. I know it's not in KWeb, but we did mention it earlier. Uh, so that one, and ASML reports on Wednesday morning, I think as well. Uh, so good to look into that space. But Jay, thank you so much for this. Have a great weekend and have a great week of not having to deal with me. And uh, we'll be uh, we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. The only thing, Scott, I say, you've got to send me, you promise to send me a picture. You don't have to put it up on, on, on the screen. you got to send me a picture of you and that singlet you talked about. <laughs> body beautiful, Jay, body beautiful. <laughs> exactly. Body positive, my friend. I'm with you, 100%. All right. Have a great week. Enjoy that week off. And uh, we'll see you in, uh, I guess, in two weeks now. Great. Thanks, Joe. And we'll see you then too. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.